Is Israel using white phosphorus in the Gaza Strip? Because a video has emerged, it apparently shows the alleged use of this incendiary weapon, a banned weapon in the densely populated Gaza. Before we proceed further, let's be clear, we cannot confirm the authenticity of these videos from the battleground. And so it is not known if the video was indeed shot in Gaza and if it was in fact a recent video. But why is this a big cause of concern? What are incendiary weapons? Why are they banned? What is white phosphorus? It is a waxy yellowish chemical with a pungent odor. It is a highly combustible chemical that burns quickly and brightly when exposed to air. It is used in incendiary weapons by militaries around the world for a variety of reasons, such as illuminating targets at night or to just inflict heavy damage. It is also very difficult to put out. You see, it clings to surfaces, including skin and clothes, and so it is extremely dangerous. It can cause severe burns, even down to the bone. Now, if that's not shocking enough, those who come into contact with white phosphorus also suffer from respiratory damage, infection and organ failure. These dangers make dropping them on civilian areas a war crime. So what are international rules? The use of white phosphorus in conflicts raises serious ethical as well as legal concerns. Now, while white phosphorus itself might not be officially classified as a chemical weapon, its fiery incendiary nature has prompted the world to take action. It is subject to regulations outlined in Protocol 3 to the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. This protocol, signed in Geneva in 1980 and enforced since 1983, lays down the law. It puts limits on the use of incendiary weapons, and that includes those containing white phosphorus. The protocol has 115 state parties, including countries such as France, the US, Russia, and Ukraine. The goal? to minimize the suffering caused by these lethal weapons. This protocol prohibits using them on civilians. Not just that, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, in effect since 2002, also provides a definition of war crimes. It prohibits actions such as the destruction of property not justified by military necessity and intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population or civilian objects. Thus, violations of this protocol may constitute war crimes if proven. Now, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's statement on the Israel-Hamas crisis is clear. The people of India stand by Israel. Prime Minister Modi expressed his support for Israel during a call with his counterpart Benjamin Netanyahu amid reports of Hamas rocket strikes on Israeli cities. Prime Minister Modi has expressed deep shock. He has pledged solidarity with Israel at this difficult time. Even though the violence in Israel has sharply divided people with one camp slamming the terrorist attack, and the other questioning is Israel's actions in Palestine. India has expressed a clear message of support. New Delhi stands with Israel. This is significant and tonight I will tell you how and why. First and foremost, let's make this clear. India's support for Israel is based on its stance against terrorism. India strongly and unequivocally condemns terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. These words highlight the firm stance of the Indian government. It's a stance that Prime Minister Modi reiterated after his call with Netanyahu. During this call, Prime Minister Modi received a comprehensive briefing on the ongoing situation. Now remember, India places anti-terrorism at the forefront of the global agenda. In fact, India has been advocating for counter-terrorism efforts in various forums. This includes the Quad, the SCO, BRICS and many others. The gravity of Hamas's attack on Israel cannot be ignored. It's a threat that extends far beyond regional borders. And it's a threat that India recognizes as a menace to peace and security. But remember, condemning terrorism and the attack on Israel is also of utmost importance for India's own national security interests. India understands that addressing terrorism on a global scale is not just a responsibility, it's a necessity. New Delhi's reaction isn't merely symbolic, it reflects the strategic and military ties between Israel and India. These two countries are not just allies, they are partners and important endeavors. They stand alongside the US and the UAE in the I2U2 infrastructure. It underlines their commitment to the region's stability and security. Also remember, defense is a cornerstone of the India-Israel bilateral relationship. In fact, India holds a distinguished position of being the largest single customer for Israeli weapon systems. Once ties were upgraded in 1992, the trajectory of defense and trade ties between the two sides took off at a breakneck pace. Israel rapidly rose to become India's second largest defense partner. Israel is among India's most reliable weapon suppliers, a supplier that puts no political preconditions. 
This was evident during the 1999 Kargil War. At the time, Israel supplied weapons and surveillance systems and upgraded existing military hardware during the war. After Prime Minister Modi's election in 2014, ties improved dramatically. In 2017, Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister ever to visit Israel. This marked a major milestone, underlining the importance of this partnership. Today, the relationship spans from tourism, agriculture to defence. According to India's Ministry of External Affairs, this is a strong high-tech partnership aligning with the aspirations of the two knowledge economies. But it's not just about trade and defence. Political ties are also friendly. Let's not forget, India has traditionally supported the Palestinian cause too. While Prime Minister Modi made a historic visit to Israel, he also achieved a dehyphenation of ties. In 2018, he separately visited Palestine, underscoring India's commitment to a balanced approach. India even hosted the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, in New Delhi during the same year. The Indian Prime Minister has skillfully balanced India's ties with Israel and Palestine. India consistently has voiced its support for a nego negotiated solution for lasting peace between the two. It has endorsed this even at the United Nations. You see, the deep divisions with, within Palestine have also become more apparent with the Palestine Authority in Ramallah and the Hamas in Gaza. So support for the Palestinian cause must not be confused with Hamas's terror. While India continues to support the Palestinian cause, it has also strengthened its strategic ties with Israel. India has experienced firsthand the devastating impacts of attacks by terrorist groups. So it understands Israel's security concerns. At the end of the day, India has consistently advocated for peace. It envisions a West Asia characterized by sustainable, long-lasting peace. This vision isn't merely a dream, it's a reflection of India's commitment to global stability and its willingness to play a constructive role in achieving that. We start the show with news that's breaking now. Here are four big developments. One, Hamas has struck the Israeli city of Ashkelon. This happened a few years back. The group warned Israelis to leave the city and then the attack happened. This city is located in southern Israel, just a few miles away from the Gaza Strip. Hamas fired a barrage of rockets on the city. Reports say more attacks could follow soon. Development number two. Israeli forces have rained rockets on Gaza City. The rockets struck a port in the city as boats nearby caught fire. There's no word yet on the casualties. We're awaiting more details. Development number three. Egyptian trucks carrying vital aid and fuel to the Gaza Strip have been forced to retreat. Why? Because Israel has warned Cairo that these trucks would be bombed. That they would be bombed if they brought any relief supplies into the Gaza Strip. Development number four, U.S. President Joe Biden dialed Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu a while back. This was their third phone call since Hamas's attack. Reports say the two leaders discuss ways to deter hostile actors from exploiting the war. They also discuss a supply of defense aid to Israel. You've seen Jody Cohen report for us from a bomb shelter as rockets rain down. She's with me again tonight, live from Ranana. Jody, how are you today? How's your family? Uh, we're doing well, thank you. We've been in and out of the bomb shelter um, this afternoon in central Israel. There have been even more uh, rocket attacks from Hamas in Gaza into southern Israel. Um, two foreign workers were killed and one is seriously injured. And this evening there was a huge barrage of rocket fire into Ashkelon, Haifa Hospital in the north of the country. has been told to prepare in the case of a war in the north and there have now been rockets fired into the north as well. Um, I'm actually at a blood donation drive in Renana where there's been thousands of people across Sorry, I thought that was a rocket siren. It's a plane overhead. There's been thousands of people across the country who have gone to donate blood, standing for hours in line um, with here. We've got 1,500 people in Tel Aviv, 1,000 people here in Renana. They're actually having to turn people away. There was a huge crowd at the gates just before, and they had to turn lots of people away because people are wanting to donate their blood. 
Another thing we're hearing is, as well as the communities rallying and trying to volunteer and send supplies to the people down south in the communities stuck there, um, we're also hearing about news of a potential unity government, which we've been talking about, Priyanka, haven't we, yesterday. But the coalition party heads have said that they would back an emergency unity government. That's been done in past times of war, and we're expecting an announcement from Benny Gantz, the head of one of the opposition parties, soon on that. Right, Jody. In fact, as we speak, we can hear sirens blaring in Israel as of now. Tell us about the situation in the country. We're also getting reports that schools and businesses have been ordered to shut down. Yes, schools um, have gone back to COVID distance learning. This afternoon, we heard of atrocities in Kfar Azar, where the fighting was going on until this morning. 70 civilians were killed there, including 40 babies, some of whom were decapitated. So horrific, horrific news coming from there. An ID officer has said it's not a war or a battlefield, it's a massacre. And Israel, coordinated with the Palestinian territories, Territories has criticised the residents there, saying instead of being appalled, oh, residents of Gaza are celebrating. We've also heard some sad news. I spoke to a man who's cut, an Irish man whose cousin had been missing since Saturday earlier today, and he had been calling on the Irish government to get involved. And he, um, it's just been confirmed that he has been found murdered. We've had some good news. 30 people um, who were in hiding since Saturday, they have been found alive. Um, they were all at the peace party in the desert where 260 young people were killed. Right, Jody, we're seeing the death toll rise. Uh, now, I think the next big question is, what is the current condition of the hostages? Hamas, as we know, has put out an open threat. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't know too much information. There were four families from the United States who um, this afternoon they called on President Biden to get involved in, in the release of the hostages. Mansour Abbas, who is the head of the Israeli Islamist Ram Party, he urged Hamas to at least release the women, children and elderly hostages. Hamas has said that they're going to film the execution of hostages for any Israeli strike that's carried out without prior warning. And they've said that they're not going to talk about any prisoner or hostage exchange before the end of the war. Right. Tell us a little bit about life in Israel at the moment, Jody. We know, as you just mentioned, schools have gone to distance learning, businesses have been ordered to shut down, and sirens are going off as rockets are fired from Gaza. Yeah, so people aren't really going out so much. Um, the, the shops are not open. Only the essential services and shops are open, like doctors, pharmacies, um, doctors, pharmacies, um, food shops. Um, so just the essentials are open. There have been some volunteers who've been collecting packages for people down south and some have gone been going down south but they've been told to stop that because at the moment it's too dangerous. There's also um, we, we know that there have been further attempts at infiltration from Gaza um, in the set from Hamas in Gaza on Tuesday and these are all unsuccessful and also on Monday we saw attempts at infiltration from Hamas in the south and from Islamic Jihad in the north and that's the first time that they had attempted that. The communities are worried in case you know they can get access through any tunnels, but the security services say that they've secured the borders. Um, we know that at least 1,500 Hamas gunmen had crossed over the border, and they've now been killed by the Israel Defense Forces. But more are expected to be in hiding around Israel, so it's a very tense time. Right, Jody Cohen, thank you so much for all those updates, and thanks for reporting for us from the battlefield. As we move on, I have a horrifying clip for you. It was released by Hamas. You have to see it for yourself. From this moment, we announce that for every attack towards our people who are safe in their homes, without previous warning, unfortunately, we will have to execute one of the civilian enemy captives that we have hostage. And we will be forced to broadcast this in video and audio. We announce this decision and we hold the responsibility in front of the whole world to the Zionist enemy and its leadership. They are responsible for this decision. This is how ugly the situation has become. For every attack, one civilian hostage will be killed. 
That's, that is what Hamas has threatened. What looked very unlikely till yesterday has now become the reality of today. Hamas has threatened to kill hostages. It is treating them like pawns, like insurance against attacks. For every attack from Israel, it says it will kill a hostage and broadcast it. Yes, it will broadcast it with video and audio. Let me remind you, at least 150 Israelis have been taken hostage by Hamas. And it's not just the Israelis. People of six to eight other nationalities have also been kidnapped. This includes two Mexicans, three Brazilians, at least one student from Nepal and at least one British national. Reports say German citizens have also been kidnapped along with at least 11 Thai nationals. There are also reports of French and Canadian hostages. You see, Israel is currently in an unprecedented hostage crisis. And what is Prime Minister Netanyahu going to do about it? The mood on ground is of anger. There is a rising demand for justice and revenge. Netanyahu has threatened Hamas that Israel is just getting started. He has called, he has called up 300,000 reservists and counting. This has happened before, but never in a span of just two days. Everything is pointing at a ground offensive. But given the hostage crisis, can Israel afford to do that? A ground offensive is risky. Hundreds of hostages are spread across just 25 miles of land in Palestine. Wherever an airstrike will land, it is likely to hit an innocent civilian. But then again, civilians have become just collateral damage in this war. There are no barriers on butchering innocent lives from both sides. Meanwhile, Qatar is in talks with Hamas for a prisoner swap. The mediators are negotiating freedom of Israeli women and children. In exchange, they are offering to release 36 Palestinian women and children from both Israeli prisons. So, will Netanyahu consider doing the same? Will it cut a deal with Hamas to rescue its hostages? We, at this point, will just pray for their safe return. Now, for more analysis, we are now being joined by Jonah Blank, who is a senior political scientist at RAND from Washington, D.C. He is also the former foreign policy advisor to President Joe Biden. Jonah, welcome to Be On. Thank you for having me. I want your assessment of this ongoing war. What happened? How did no one see this coming? How did no one see Hamas coming? Well, that is, uh, that is a question that no one has answered satisfactorily yet. Uh, former top generals uh, in the Israeli military and former top officials of the Israeli intelligence services have been warning for months that the ongoing political crisis in Israel before any of the war in Gaza was weakening Israel's defensive posture. Uh, we don't know yet whether that was directly responsible for this clear intelligence failure, but I don't think anyone can say that, uh, that Israel has in any way prepared for an attack that was very, very coordinated and very, very sophisticated and uh, tremendously tragic uh, and uh, absolutely inexcusable. Now let's talk about the hostage crisis, unprecedented hostage crisis for Israel. Negotiations are on to release Israeli hostages, as we are given to understand. But a big threat, an ominous threat rather, coming from Hamas, which is terrifying. When will these hostages return safely, in your assessment? Well, we all hope that they will return safely uh, as soon as possible. But let's not undersell the real threat that we see right here. Hamas, as we've seen in the past few days and in the decade and a half earlier, we've seen that Hamas is very willing to engage in horrific acts to achieve what it considers to be its aims. Now, its aims have never really succeeded in advancing the cause of safety and peace for the Palestinian people, let alone the people of Gaza. Uh, Will they actually start executing hostages? They may. Um, and Israel is very aware of it and has, uh, has dealt with this before. But let's be aware, we've seen horrific bloodshed on both sides, and we're going to see a lot more on both sides before this is over. Right, Jonah, I'm just going to repeat your statement. You're saying that Hamas at this point is very willing to commit to these horrific acts. I think the, another obvious question that everybody is asking is who funds Hamas? Where is it getting its weaponry from? 
Well, we know that Hamas has historically been supported by Iran, uh, in addition to other outside players, but most noteworthy Iran. Uh, we've he heard a lot of reporting about Iran's support for this particular action. As far as I know, we don't have actual proof of it yet, but uh, it would it would be uh, naive to think that Iran was not involved in the planning or at least provision of material support for it. Right. My final question, Jonah, do you see any immediate hope of a ceasefire? Sadly, I don't. Um, in my view, Israel has very little option other than to, uh, to take on uh, Hamas and to respond militarily. And uh, as, we've, as we've seen before in so many places in so many countries, um, a committed terrorist group holding hostages is a nightmare situation. Right, Jonah, thank you so much for all your analysis. Thanks for joining us on Gravitas tonight. Thank you for having me.